When we flush a toilet ashore, we don't have to bother about what happens next. The stuff disappears. It's somebody else's responsibility from then on. But that's not the case on board ship. To keep our treatment plant working properly, everyone, not just the engineers, has to understand what we can and can't do with the sewage and the grey water from basins, showers and so on, which we produce. Everyone doesn't just mean the ship's crew. It includes anyone who comes on board. Pilots, stevedores, even visitors from the shore office. The reason we have regulations about how to deal with sewage is just common sense, really. This stuff is not something you want to find when you take your family to the beach for the day. What we're allowed to do with sewage is covered by international regulations, the revised MARPOL Annex 4, to be exact. This says there are no restrictions on discharging sewage that has been through an approved treatment plant. But if your ship doesn't have an approved plant, as laid down in Marpol, then we can't discharge any comminuted, disinfected sewage closer than three miles from the nearest land. If we're within that distance, it has to go into a holding tank, even if it's been through the treatment plant. Between three and 12 miles from shore, we're allowed to discharge any comminuted and disinfected sewage. So as long as we're underway, and don't dump the contents of a holding tank all in the same place. If we're more than 12 miles out of... If we're 12... If we're more than 12 miles from shore, we can put untreated sewage into the sea. But we'd only do that if we close down the treatment plant for maintenance or cleaning. So what does happen when I flush the lavatory and wash my hands? Well, the waste goes to a treatment plant, either using gravity and pumps, or, in more modern systems, using a vacuum. Almost all treatment plants on ships work through what is called extended aeration. This simply means that air is blown through sewage, which stimulates the production of these little creatures aerobic bacteria. Aerobic means that they exist in the presence of oxygen. Their job in life is to eat sewage. And you thought you had a tough job. In principle, this is how an aeration plant works. There are three compartments. Aeration, settling, and chlorine contact. Sewage flows or is pumped through a coarse filter into the aeration compartment and air is bubbled through it from a series of diffusers. The air comes from low pressure compressors. The bacteria digest the sewage, turning it into inert sludge, water and CO2. Some of the sludge collects in the bottom of the compartment. The digested effluent, along with the bacteria and the remaining sludge, flow through another coarse screen into the settling tank. Sludge and bacteria sink to the bottom and are recirculated to the aeration compartment. Debris is skimmed from the surface. The clear effluent flows through a chlorinator into a contact tank. The chlorine kills off any remaining harmful bacteria. Incidentally, check the local regulations for where you are sailing. Some countries, Korea for example, insist on chlorination, but others, such as Canada, forbid it. Grey water from showers, sinks and so on also flows into the contact tank, and the resulting effluent, which is now clean and harmless, is discharged overboard. The discharge is controlled by float switches located in the last chamber. The switches start a discharge pump 
which forces the fluid through a skin valve and overboard. There is an emergency overflow, but it is very important to prevent sewage overflowing into the bilges, because if that happens, the oily water separator and the oil content monitor won't work. That's how it operates. But how do we keep it working properly? First, by making sure that only human soil and toilet paper go in here. Let me show you what I mean. This is the inlet filter on the front of the aeration compartment. It's a coarse screen designed to let human soil and toilet paper pass through it and nothing else. So please, no cigarette ends or packets, no condoms, no female sanitary products, no newspapers, and no kitchen towels. Toilet paper is designed to dissolve. Kitchen towels aren't. Those are the obvious things that shouldn't go in here. But I found some really unusual ones. So please, no T-shirts and socks, no light bulbs and no boxes of pills. And if the crew member who lost his false teeth in here is watching, you can't have them back. Remember, if you can't eat it, neither can the treatment plant. Talking of food. Grey water, like sink waste, doesn't go through the aeration process. So there is one area in the ship that we have to be very careful, the galley. Too much grease can block pipes. So for those of you who work here, try to keep as much of it as possible out of the sink. Then there's cooking oil. There was a case in the United States when Port State inspectors sent down divers to investigate an oil spill from a ship in harbor. It turned out that someone had emptied the entire contents of the deep fat fryer into the galley sink. If you need to get rid of cooking oil, put it in the waste oil tank. Of course, lavatories have to be cleaned too. Many of the TV adverts you'll have seen for household cleaners used in homes ashore show them killing bacteria. But in a ship's treatment plant, bacteria are our friends, not our enemies. So we have to use special cleaners that don't kill aerobic bacteria. When you maintain your system, it's very important to inspect the outlet connection, particularly if your system uses vacuum technology instead of water and gravity to move the sewage from the lavatories to the treatment plant. A break here or in any part of the piping will reduce the efficiency of the vacuum and has to be replaced. There's another reason that this connection is important. It prevents any backflow of sewage gases into the toilet compartment. But in case they do get in, it's essential to keep toilet and washing areas properly ventilated. Check extraction grills, louvers, and ducts to make sure they are clear and not blocked with dirt and fluff. If there are fans installed, make sure they work. And ventilation isn't just an issue for toilet and washing areas. We've also got to check air extraction from alleyways and make sure essential air gaps have not been blocked and that the forced ventilation of cabin spaces is operating efficiently. Now, let's get back to the treatment plant. The disinfectant tablets in the chlorinator also have to be checked regularly during routine rounds and the proper levels maintained. Make sure you keep sufficient spares as recommended by the manufacturer. From time to time, the plant itself has to be cleaned and the buildup of sludge removed. The manual for your particular plant will tell you how often to do this and precisely what needs to be done. In principle, we shut the system down and empty it either partially or completely. We open up the compartments, inspect them, and clean them. 
We check the operation of float switches and alarms, the condition of air diffusers and the compressor filters, belts and bearings. We replace any defective jointing. It is particularly important to check the compressors and the diffusers which supply air. If there is insufficient air, the aerobic bacteria die and are replaced by their opposite, anaerobic bacteria, which thrive in the absence of oxygen. They also digest sewage, but in the process they produce gases which are highly toxic, flammable and, in some cases, <laughs> explosive. Hydrogen sulphide, methane, ammonia. Here's a bit of advice that most of you won't need. But there's always someone. When you are cleaning the plant, don't go inside and wear a face mask, goggles and gloves. Believe me, you don't want sewage under your fingernails or in a cut or splashed in your eyes. Very rarely there may be exceptional circumstances where someone has to go inside the plant. Remember, this is dangerous. Treat it like any other entry into an enclosed space. Do a proper risk assessment. Take all the necessary precautions. Once the system is clean, you can refill and start it again. And, as with any maintenance work on board, keep a clear, simple record of what you have done. We normally clean the treatment plant when the ship's in dry dock or sometimes in port. If cleaning is done in port, sludge and the rest of the plant's contents have to be discharged to proper facilities ashore. On rare occasions, we might clean the plant at sea because so long as we're far enough from land, untreated sewage can be discharged overboard. This is also an opportunity to use a bacteria-killing cleaner, so long as the system is flushed with seawater before the treatment plant is reconnected. After starting the plant up again, it takes between 10 days and two weeks for the aerobic bacteria to re-establish themselves. So, if you're cleaning it at sea, you must only completely desludge the system when the ship is going to be in unrestricted waters for that time. So that's the sewage treatment plant. Ashore, we don't need to bother about how it works. On board, it's very different. All of us have to pay attention to what we can and can't put in it. And, as engineers, we have to know how to operate and maintain it systematically and effectively. Because if we don't, you can be sure that it's going to be a real pain in the... Oh.